Hello everyone, I am Chris from Simply Classic. Welcome to the Bag Makers Workroom. Today starts our 10 part series on everything that you need to know to have a successful workroom. In episode one, we're going to talk about equipment. Episode two is going to be tools and notions. In the third episode, we're going to talk about our very favorite thing, textiles and materials. Number four is going to be cutting tools and methods. In the fifth episode, we're going to look at the difference between interfacing and stabilizers. Number six is going to be needles and threads. Number seven is going to be everything straps, including how to avoid having your straps twist. Eight, we're going to talk about tips and tricks, things that have helped me in my workroom. Number nine is going to be that thing that stumps all of us pricing. How much do you charge or should you charge for your bags? And then episode 10, we're going to talk a little bit about inspiration, but I'm also going to show you how to translate a photograph into a real life bag, keeping those proportions the same. So I hope you enjoy the series and I want to welcome you to my workroom. Welcome to episode one of the Bag Makers Workroom. Today we're going to talk about workroom equipment. Often I'm asked the question, what kind of machine do you have? Do I have to have an industrial machine? What's the difference between a domestic and an industrial machine? We're going to answer all of those questions for you today and more. All right, we're going to start by talking about sewing machines. A domestic sewing machine is one that you can typically find at your local quilt shop or sewing machine dealer. There are many different brands of domestic machines. Everything from Bernina to Baby Lock, Brother, Juki, Janome, Elna, Faf, and the list goes on and on. This here is a Janome Skyline 7 and it is the machine that I use typically to use lighter weight fabrics. So when I have to sew linings of cotton or linen, this is my go-to machine. Now there's a few things you need to know about these machines. First of all, they can be anywhere between a couple hundred dollars to several thousand dollars. Typically they do more than one thing. And what I mean by that is they go forward and backwards, but they also typically have a wide variety of different stitches that you can use to decorate your project. Most times these machines are used by quilters and garment makers and they are obviously the most readily types of machines available on the market. Now depending on your budget and your space is going to depend on what kind of machine that you can get. So. These are usually fairly compact. Sometimes you can get them and they will not only be a sewing machine, but they can also convert to an embroidery machine. So if you'd like a multi-purpose machine, those are certainly out there. But it's certainly a handy machine and one you definitely need to use in your arsenal. Now, depending on the manufacturer and the motor size will depend on what the machine can handle. So some machines can only handle a couple layers of very lightweight fabrics like cottons and linens. Others can handle a little bit more like some leathers and faux leathers. Your needle size is going to depend greatly on what the machine is going to do and how it's going to handle the project. So for instance, if you want to use some faux leather on a machine like this, you're probably going to need to move up to either a jeans needle or a leather needle, which is just a larger needle. It's going to give you a bigger hole and you're going to have much better success. Typically these machines come with some accessories and some different feet. The main things that you need to look for when you shop for a machine like this is you definitely want to have a zipper foot. You also want to have what's called a Teflon foot and these Teflon feet are very useful when you come when it comes to sewing with leathers, vinyls, 
those types of things because it does not stick to the back or the, the, the material does not stick to the back of the foot. Okay. The other thing you want to ha get is what's called a walking foot and walking foot typically are pretty big like this, but what will happen is that it's got a, the foot here has got two different layers. And the way walking feet work is you have the feed dogs at the bottom that are pulling your fabric through. Well, when you have a walking foot, you also have a sort of feed dog on the top that pulls your fabric through. So essentially the two work in conjunction to pull your fabric through evenly so that when you sew, you don't end up with your top layer having a big bunch left over. It, it just helps minimize that. Now, another thing that's going to be really useful if you have a domestic machine and you're using it for bag making is what's called a hump jumper. And that's what this is here. Now, hump jumpers, you can certainly buy plastic ones like this, or you can create your own by taking some fabric and rolling it up on itself and putting it behind your foot or in front of your foot, wherever you need it, to get over that hump that you're trying to sew. One thing I would tell you is very important about any kind of machine you buy this in this day and age is you really want a needle down position. And what that means is when you stop sewing, the needle's going to be in the downward position. So it's going to be holding your fabric. So if your fabric happens to shift, you're not going to have a problem with it being out of line or not having a straight seam. I recommend that if you're looking for a new machine and you'd like to buy a domestic machine, that's what your budget is, that's what your space limitations are, go to your local dealer, bring some fabrics that you want to sew. So for instance, if you are interested in bag making and you want to sew cork or faux leathers, bring a few pieces of that and test the machines out. Sit and sew and see how they work. Some are going to work better than others. You also hear sometimes the term semi-industrial, and all that really means is it's a domestic machine that maybe has a little bit more power and can sew a little bit thicker fabrics. So when it comes time to buying a domestic machine, do your homework, go ahead and test out as many machines as you can before you make that decision. It'll be a great tool for your arsenal. Let's talk industrial machines. So an industrial machine is typically a machine that's going to do one thing and it's going to do it really well. So this machine here is a Conso 206 RB5 and it is a machine I bought about 15 to 20 years ago. I originally bought it because I was working um, in the window treatment home decor industry and it was a great machine for doing slip covers and bed skirts and some of those things that have bulkier seams. It is turned into a fabulous bag making machine. So this is considered a flat bed. And as you see here, it has what's called or what is known as just a flat bed, just kind of like a, a tabletop. Industrial machines usually come with the table. So you really need to make sure you have the space for them. I've seen a few now that the tables have been a little more compact, but typically a table is roughly uh, three feet. The, this machine here goes forward and it goes backwards and that's it. There's nothing else it does. And it is a great machine for bulk. So if I want to sew two pieces of cotton together or two pieces of linen together, I'm going to go to my domestic machine to do that. If I want to sew a couple of layers of faux leather, then this is the machine that I'm going to come to. A few things you want to look for with industrial machines. When I purchased this machine many years ago, it had what was called a clutch motor. A clutch motor is a very loud, clanky, hard to control motor that I'm not even sure if they sell them on new machines today. But if you're in the market for a used machine, you might want to check to see if it has a clutch motor. Now, if it does, no worries. You can buy a servo motor and it's S-E-R-V-O, servo motor. And to be honest with you, once I put my servo motor on this machine, it sewed differently. It's very controllable. It's quiet. I will turn it on 
and you see there's no noise at all and it runs beautifully. So if you happen to have a clutch motor and you've been sitting on the fence as to whether or not you should get a servo motor, I highly recommend you do. They're not super expensive, $100, $150, and it will change the way you sew. So that's number one, make sure you get a servo motor. Number two is that you really want a walking foot machine. So not all industrial machines have a walking foot, but the walking foot is going to let me crank this, allow you to have that foot that goes up and down, just like what I mentioned on the domestic machine, where you have equal pressure pulling that fabric through as you sew. That is really essential when it comes to bag making. Some of the newer companies out there have features to their machines that this one does not have. For instance, that needle down position that I mentioned on the in, uh, domestic machine, that now comes on industrial machines. You also can get laser lights and um, automatic guides, seam guides, and I mean, it's just amazing the kind of things that you can get on the industrial machines. All of these industrial machines have automatic bobbin winders over here on the right hand side, and they're heavy, they're metal. They are you're going to need somebody to help you get it in the house, probably. Um, they all come with a foot pedal on the table, um, some kind of lift, either with your knee or with your foot, to lift the presser foot up and down. And honestly, if you are serious about bad making and you have the space and the budget for it, I would say definitely go ahead and get an industrial machine. Now, there's several different brands, just like the domestic machines. You have you have Brother, you have Juki, this is a Conso, there's Texo, Sailrite, Cowboy, and the list goes on and on. So do your homework and make sure that you get those few things I talked about. The only other thing I would suggest is to look at the clearance between the presser foot and the bed of the machine and make sure that you have a large enough clearance for what you want to sew. So the clearance on my machine is right at a half inch. So I can put up to a half inch of thickness underneath my presser foot and sew. I suggest you really take a look at that and take a look at exactly how much thickness you think you might sew and make sure that you've got enough clearance there. I've never had a problem with something not fitting under this machine but I'm not doing super thick projects either. would also say that you, you typically have a dial here that you can adjust your stitch length. Mine goes from one to 10, some go from one to five. It just depends on the brand of the actual machine. Highly recommend an industrial machine if you can get it in your budget. And of course, the, the prices of these are all over the board. Um, if you can get a used one, they last forever. It should be fine as long as you have somebody that can service it or you can learn how to service, service it yourself. Okay, we're going to talk about one other kind of industrial machine, and that is a cylinder arm machine. And basically what it is, is it has a cylinder arm on it. So you can actually take a bag and put it on this machine to stop, top stitch it. It also does really well with sharp curves. Now, just like the Conso, this machine does one thing and it does it really well, and that's it sews forward and it sews backwards. It has a walking foot on it, just like the Conso. It has a stitch dial here from zero to 10. And it is a little bit newer model. And what I mean by that is Texo has got some really great upgrades to their machines and one of them is a laser light which is this right here that actually helps you if you're going to be like a lot of times i use this machine for quilting put some foam or something behind the fabric and it really helps me stay on track when i'm sewing the lines it also has a drop down seam gauge that you just twist to either reduce or, inc or um, increase. It did come with a servo motor, like I talked about. 
And it obviously, you know, obviously came with this table and it has a uh, foot pedal here at the bottom. If I had to do all this all over again, I'm gonna tell you, I would start out with a cylinder or machine. This machine comes with a flat bed attachment. So I can actually take the bed and put it on this machine and it lines up with this. So essentially it goes from a flatbed machine to a cylinder arm machine. That is really what you want. It's going to save in space, it's going to save in money, and it's gonna give you the best of both worlds. So if you are in the market for an industrial machine, I highly recommend looking for a cylinder arm machine that has a way to convert to a flatbed. This is a Texo 2750 Pro. The Pro gives it those extra little features like the laser light and the drop down seam guide. Like I said, it does come with a servo motor. And one of the things this machine comes with that I absolutely love is the needle down position. The Conso does not have that. It's too old of a machine to, um, to, to have it, but this one does. So make sure again, you pay attention to these things. I think that it's, you're going to be much happier with your final decision if you look for the walking foot, for the needle down position, for the servo motor, and then a cylinder arm with a flatbed attachment. We're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk about irons. And obviously as sewists, and it doesn't matter what you sew, you need an iron. It makes a huge difference in the outcome of your final project. I has, have this iron here. It is a Aliso, I think is how you say it. And it is the type of iron that you do not have to turn upwards. It has these little feet that pop out as you set it down. And therefore you can just pick it up, iron, put it right back down. Now I've seen mixed reviews about this iron and I actually really like it. I would definitely get another one if something happened to this one. But one thing I will say is I do not put water in my tank. Instead, what I do is I have a misting bottle. And if I do need to add any kind of mist or, or um, water to something, I just use this bottle instead of putting it in the iron. I think it's going to make the iron last a little bit longer. There's obviously Rowenta is a great iron company. Some of them actually have tanks that you can put water in, um, which is really nice. I had one of those for years. So just make sure that you have a good quality iron. Now, I'm gonna tell you, we're gonna go over my very favorite piece of equipment next. Without a doubt, my very favorite piece of equipment in my workroom is my heat press. I've often thought about that. If anybody asked me, what is your favorite piece of equipment? Most people would think I would say my sewing machine. And while I do love my sewing machine, my heat press has absolutely changed the way I sew and make bags. It has saved me so much time. I would highly recommend a heat press. Now, this, the, when you start doing research on heat presses, there's a lot of different things you need to look at. You can get some with steam, without steam. There's all kinds of different features. And I'm gonna tell you what I landed on and I'm very, very happy with. I got this heat press from Heat Press Nation and it is just a um, black series, HPN, which is Heat Press Nation black series. What I love about this is the larger bed. I wanted to make sure that when I put a side of a bag on here and was trying to adhere some deck of the light or whatever it was that I wasn't going to have to do it in sections. The bed measures 15 and three quarters by 19 and a half. It is really the perfect size. Now there are times when I have to move things over. I can't get those long pieces all in one, but for the most part, 99% of what I do fits here on this. On a heat press, this is the part that gets hot up here. Okay, not this bottom part. So whatever, whenever I lay something down, I always use a Teflon sheet over what I'm pressing just to protect it. That way, if any of the glue is showing on the back, sometimes your pieces aren't cut exactly right, it's not gonna get on the actual press itself. And then the 
These here can just be thrown away. You can get a new one if you need it. I've had mine for a very long time. Now, some of the features that I got on mine, besides the larger bed, is when you push this down, I can actually set a timer on here where it will pop up after a certain amount of time. So whenever I'm fusing Woven Fuse 2 to cottons or linens, I set it for 15 seconds. So I can literally push this down, walk away from it, and in 15 seconds, it's gonna automatically pop up on its own. Highly recommend that, it is fantastic. You don't have to sit there and watch the time and try to figure out exactly how long this has been down on your project. It's easy to change it. There's just a little set button here and it goes up and down. You can set the heat, you can set the time, and then it also has a counter on here. Um, it is just absolutely fabulous. Now, another feature that you may want to consider that I did not get is sometimes you can actually get these where the bed pulls out. And that is really convenient for folks who do uh, t-shirts and things because you're having to put the t-shirt on here and obviously you don't want to touch this top section and burn yourself. So that's a really great feature if you are maybe doing both bags and t-shirts to maybe get the bed that slides out. Now I'm going to tell you a couple things about a heat press. It does take up some room and I actually have mine on a little craftsman bench that has a toolbox and it actually has some drawers over here so I'm able to utilize the drawers which is great. It's good and heavy and it's metal so I don't have to worry about anything burning. Um, it was really a perfect size for this. Um, but these are, they're big and they're cumbersome and they're heavy and so you need to have the space for it. They're not cheap either. Um, if you can afford it, I would say definitely try to get yourself one. I think it'll change the way you sew, um, but just be aware, you know, they're not cheap. The other thing I wanted to tell you is that you need a dedicated outlet for it. So if I have this plugged in, I cannot have anything else plugged into that outlet at all, or it'll trip my breaker. And that's common for heat presses. So because they pull, they use so much energy. So just keep that in mind that you do need a separate place where you can plug it in. I cannot plug this and my iron in at the same time, or this and my dehumidifier in at the same time. When this is plugged in, nothing else is plugged in. Um, but it's great because you can go ahead and use it. What I do is gonna get all my pieces ready, I press, you know, whatever it is on that I need to, and then I just unplug it and then I'm done. I go to my iron and I'm good to go. So heat press, absolutely favorite thing. If you can manage with the space, I would definitely say get one. So let's recap. My experience has told me that in my workroom, I mostly use my domestic machine for linings and thinner fabrics. I would suggest an industrial cylinder arm with a flatbed attachment if you can get an industrial machine. Of course, you need an iron and a heat press if possible. Those main pieces of equipment will get you going to be a successful bag maker, whether you're a hobbyist or you'd like to get into it to make a little money. There are plenty of other types of equipment that we did not cover today. There's clicker presses and all different types of things. These are the essentials. These are the things that I think you need to get started. So I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Bag Makers Workroom. Next time we're going to talk about tools and notions and all of those little things that make the job easier. So until next time, happy sewing.